Welcome to my talk. This is UP and Proxy Pot, Fake the Funk, Become a Black Hat Proxy, Man in the Middle of their TLS, and Scrape the Wire. Before we begin, I'm Chad Seaman, but around here at DEF CON, you can just call me Dirt. Uh, I am part of the Akamai CERT team. I'm actually a team lead and senior engineer on that team. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the CERT team, which is probably all of you, uh, you may have heard of some of our research before. We focus on DDoS and emerging threats research, but that typically leads us down the path of malware and botnets and proxies and other good stuff. So before we begin, you're gonna see me talk about IoT. A lot of you are going to think IoT means Internet of Things. That's not true for me. Uh, it's the Internet of Trash. Whenever you see me say IoT, that's what I mean. So what's this talk about? Well, SSDP and UPnP have been widely vulnerable on IoT devices for nearly 20 years. It's not only possible, but also very easy to turn these devices into proxy servers. When attackers find vulnerable IoT devices susceptible to this kind of attack, they turn these devices into short-lived proxy server and delete their tracks when they're done. If they don't delete their tracks, the tracks will delete themselves. We're going to cover SSDP and UPnP, previous UP and proxy research can and campaigns uh, conducted by me. And finally, UP and proxy pot, how it works and findings from a year of geographically distributed deployments. So first things first, SSDP and UPnP. <clears throat> SSDP stands for Simple Service Discovery Protocol. It's a technology that's built for the LAN, uses broadcast addressing with HTTP over UDP. It essentially allows machines on a LAN to announce themselves uh, and or hear announcements from their neighbors uh, or network peers, and then expose uh, them to UPnP which will in turn expose services such as printing and media sharing and network configuration, all that kind of stuff. Uh, UPnP is universal plug and play. It's also built for the LAN. It's good, uh, good old HTTP and SOAP, SOAP as in XML. Um, it lets machines on a LAN inquire about the services configuration options offered by that device. Uh, it also allows them to access those services and or potentially modify those configurations. Uh, so a good example of this is uh, an Xbox, right? Uh, an Xbox or a PC game may need you to forward certain ports or certain traffic around the firewall uh, rather than deal with the state of managing that in the NAT. So that's what UPnP basically enables. It allows your Xbox to go forward and say, hey, poke a hole in the firewall, send everything on UDP, you know, one, two, three, four uh, over to me. So what is wrong with these technologies? Well, for SSDP, uh, IoT devices are notoriously bad at deploying this correctly. It's the same is true for UPnP. Um, it's built for the LAN, uh, but they stick it on the WAN just because, I don't know, just because. Uh, it was a reflected DDoS vector, up and coming, most popular MVP, king of the hill, whatever you want to call it, in 2014 and 2015. It's still fairly popular for that, but it's not as popular, um, mostly due to other vectors becoming more popular, not because it's gotten that much less abused. Um, we're still finding this bullshit everywhere. Um, older products are still on the internet. Um, amazingly, newer products, and new is there in quotes, but uh, some newer products, and by newer I mean within the past few years, still have these problems. Um, so 20 years later, uh, at a minimum, uh, 14 years, and here we are, still having the same old problems. So UPnP, Universal Plug and Play, uh, once again, built for the LAN, but they seem to just love to stick this stuff on the WAN too. Uh, it treats the LAN as a safe space, which is fine, but the WAN is not a safe space. So when you're listening on the WAN and thinking it's a LAN, it's a little bit of a problem. Um, it just does whatever its trusted network peers tell it to do does not require auth. There's not really a whole lot protecting it. Um, information disclosure, it will tell you everything. Model numbers, makes, serial numbers. Uh, on top of that, it will tell you how to talk to it, what services it exposes, what configurations, what data uh, you can push in, and what data you can expect to get out. Um, it facilitates configuration changes on some devices. It makes it very easy to do those changes. Uh, in some cases, there are known RCE injections in the UPnP daemons uh, in the SOAP handling. So uh, your basically SOAP can 
can get remote command execution on the underlying device. So let's take a quick look at the history here and why I talk about 20 years. Uh, the first instance that I could find of somebody exposing something here is uh, 2003 Bjorn Stickler. Um, he came public with a Netgear UPnP information disclosure. Uh, a couple years later, uh, I'm going to slaughter this guy's name, Arminj Himmel, I think, in 2006, gave a talk at the same conference, uh, and he launched a website called upmphacks.org. There's a ton of great info here. His talk really kind of blew the lid off of all the problems that UPMP actually had and all of the potential uh, vectors uh, it could expose people to. Uh, and then in 2011, Daniel Garcia gave a talk at DEF CON 19 called UPMP Mapping. It was a great talk. It kind of touched on this proxy and capability and some of the problems with UPMP. Um, I was in the crowd. It freaked me out enough that I think my TP-Link router at the time was actually impacted by this. And they went ahead and uh, I went ahead and remoted into my home network and disabled UPMP from, from the, the talk while I was in the talk from my phone. So. so a brief history of UPMP proxy. So UPMP proxy in 2014, like I said, SSDP is the new up and coming DDoS vector starting to see it abused pretty widely. Um, we, Akamai CERT, at that time we were known as the PLX CERT, uh, are asked to write about it, you know, start digging into it, put on advisory and all that good stuff. So in 2015, this, this was happening at the end of 2014. Uh, at, in early 2015, the SSDP research leads me to discover uh, UPMP and it kind of turns on that, that 2011 talk in my head. I'm like, oh man, I remember this being like a shit show. So uh, in 2016, I decide that since it's been about a decade after um, the SANE conference talk and the UPMP hacks, it might be fun to revisit this and see how bad this, this landscape is. Um, are we talking hundreds of thousands? Are we talking millions? Uh, and just talk about and kind of try and bring the fact that this is 10 years later, these things are still a problem and these threats still exist in the real world uh, and everybody just kind of seemed to have forgotten about it. Uh, so I start writing that paper. The reason it's relevant is because I had to write a tool chain uh, to test some of these theories and concepts. Um, this is a tool chain here that was for testing the NAT injection capabilities on exposed UPnP devices. So. In the top there, you see the SSDP banner that we get back. Uh, we take the 192.168.01. Um, we change that to the public facing IP address that we found UPnP responding on. In our SOAP payload, we set that port 5555 uh, is going to port in, point into 192.168.01, which we know is the router at this point on port 80. Uh, we then issue that SOAP request via curl. And what we see here is before the injection and after the injection in the scan results there, uh, TCP 80 is filtered. You couldn't get to it. Um, but once I open TCP 55555 uh, and then I hit it in a browser, I am greeted with the admin login page. So that's a little bit, pro little bit of a problem being able to get around the firewall that easy. As I'm doing this research uh, in September of 2016, we get hit with a 620 gigabit per second sustained DDoS attack from a botnet. At that point, the botnet was unknown. Uh, it ultimately got named Mirai. So as I'm digging into that, uh, I'm inspecting attack sources. I'm seeing lots of IoT. There's a decent overlap with the existing identified UPnP data set that I had from my decade after disclosure research. Uh, I decided that the UPnP info leaks could maybe help. Uh, and I start scraping those and poking these devices in general, trying to figure out what the heck they are. Uh, so it turns out correlation is not causation. Uh, the fact that these devices were present in the Mirai botnet has nothing to do with Mirai. Uh, it's just that shitty devices are shitty. And if it's compromisable one way, it's probably compromisable about two or three uh, in the internet of trash space, that is. So 
having already written the script to dump the NAT tables as part of the NAT injection testing, um, I started doing that just to see, you know, maybe there's something weird going on in there that we could figure out. Uh, it, like I said, it was not related at all. But what I did notice when I did that was there were some really weird entries in some of these devices out in the wild. Um, <clears throat> the entries pointing to DNS servers, they pointed to Akamai CDN servers, they had been pointing at HTTP and HTTPS web servers, which is really interesting, but I have other shit to do. Got a really big botnet, I got to figure out what the hell's going on. So I kind of just stick that in the mental back burner and move on. So on the timeline here, we're down here at the Mirai botnet and huge DDoS. So while I'm investigating that, I accidentally uncover the UPN proxy stuff, but I'm too busy dealing with this botnet. 2017, things start to calm down. Mirai, at least I have tooling to, to be able to better track it and handle it. So I start looking back at some of my other research um, and I decide I'm gonna look at what some of those really weird NAT entries were on some of those devices. And I begin scanning the entire internet and dumping all of the NAT tables of all of these exposed UPnP daemons. This is when we uncover the UPN proxy campaigns. So UPN proxy uncovered by the numbers. Um, there were 4.8 million SSDP responders in that data set. 765,000 had exposed UPnP. Uh, it's roughly 16%. So of those, 65,000 were actively injected with UPnP entries. That's 9% of the total vulnerable population and 1.3% of the total responders. Um, of those, 17,599 unique endpoints were identified as being injected in these devices. Uh, typically, if a device had one injection, it had multiples. The most injected destination had 18.8 .8 million instances across 23,236 devices. The second most injected destination had 11 million instances across 59,943 devices. I point this out because it shows two kind of campaigns running simultaneously here. Uh, the most injected destination obviously had a lot more instances of injections across a much smaller pool of devices. And then the second most ingested, injected destination had a lot less injections, but a much larger swath of devices that they were injected on. All in all, there were 15.9 million injections to DNS servers, 9.5 million injections to web servers, uh, and 155,000 injections to HTTPS servers. While I'm doing this research, I'm talking to some fellow researchers and friends, and one of the guys goes, hey, I think my friend's working on something very similar. Uh, would you be interested in talking to them? And absolutely, I was. I'm very sorry to the researcher I talked to. I don't remember your name and I can't find the email and Symantec did not give you a shout out on their blog. So thank you for your hard work and I'm sorry. Um, what they ultimately found was that there was an APT group and they were running this inception framework uh, where the attackers were basically using these uh, UPN proxy instances and they were chaining them together. So they would <clears throat> log into their VPS, they would inject a proxy route that pointed to another UPN proxy vulnerable device. They would then use that injection to inject another route, then use that injection to inject another route that ultimately pointed out to their target destination, which was a cloud storage provider uh, for uploading their malware. And then they would use that to upload their malware to the cloud platform. Uh, and this is partly to get around um, detection, right? A lot of a lot of times you'll have these lists of known proxies, known endpoints, Tor, et cetera. And when you've got a pool of you know tens of thousands of home devices that aren't on any of those lists, you're much less likely to set off some alarm bells when you log in and upload a nasty file. So <clears throat> really interesting research. Um, I gave him my tools. He was able to confirm it was what we thought it was. And then I was able to confirm in my data that I could see some of the the similar clustering. So what you're seeing here in the graph on the right is two different bubble graphs. Um, the size of the circle is respective to the number of outbound routes found on that device. And then every blue line is pointing in the direction of a relationship. There's an arrow. So where you see the thick blue on one side, that is the tips of the arrows running into one another. And there's, there's clearly two different strategies. The top cluster, you have a larger pool 
with a handful of routes that go out and they all point into a smaller pool of devices that may only route to one or two or three things. Uh, and in the bottom cluster, you see a centralized high route out uh, collection and then um, they all point out to different endpoints. Uh, so it's, it's just a different structure, a different strategy of building that chaining, but the chaining exists and I thought that was pretty cool. So we find all this stuff, uh, but it's not super widespread. I'm just kidding, it's everywhere. Um, so there's 73 brands and over 400 models that we could identify. And it's important there that I say we could identify because we were only able to successfully fingerprint with confidence about 24% of these based on information leaks. And those information leaks weren't just uh, what came from the UPMP daemon. Sure, it helped a ton because it's a super chatty, uh, it exposes quite a bit of information about the device, like I said, uh, but we would also go so far as to attempt to see what other ports were there, SSH banners, um, anything like that, that we could potentially fingerprint on, we tried. And still, we could only get about 24%. So that is quite a quite a considerable amount. 73 brands and 400 models is, is a nice chunk, but you got to remember that there's 76% that we couldn't even identify. So who knows what they are? This public, uh, this, this publication goes live and, you know, the crowd goes mild. Nobody really cared. It didn't really get a lot of attention. I was, I was pretty disappointed. I, I thought it was a very cool finding, but, and I'm downplaying that a little bit. So a couple people cared. Um, the people that needed to care, care. So I'll take that as a win. Uh, the research did get some industry attention um, through some, some trust groups and work groups and stuff. Uh, it did get elevated and passed along. And it was ultimately used to help some ISPs support the case internally for uh, cleanup and, and you know sanitation efforts. So progress is made behind the scenes. Uh, some networks start filtering SSDP. That's all good. Um, you'll, you'll see that the result of that in the next couple slides. Ultimately, I get an email from a journalist. Uh, she's doing some work and she was recording this new show. Uh, her name's Justine Underhill. And she wanted to talk to me about UPN Proxy because the episode she was recording was on IoT and security and everything else. So while we're recording this uh, video, uh, I decide that, you know, she's asking questions about how hard is this? How long does it take? How much does it cost? And I'm like, well, I'll just, I'll just show you. So I pull out the laptop, jump on uh, the internet, run ZMAP, and I hit the first 1000 things that respond to my SSDP probe. And then I start dumping their NAT tables. And while I'm sitting there showing her this, I'm like, man, I think we just found something new. Like this, this wasn't in the previous scans. And this is how I accidentally discovered the eternal silence stuff, which it was cool because we, we didn't really have a solid case. I had proposed that attackers could use this to route around the firewall, but we didn't really have a solid proof from our existing scans that that was occurring yet. So these are what the injections look like after they go through our logging process and are converted into JSON. Um, you can see that they are targeting IPs inside the LAN, 192.168.10 space, probably from the information leak from the SSDP banner. Uh, and then, so like there on 166, you can see that they tried to open a port forward to 139 in port 445. So they're injecting routes into the LAN space uh, and they are targeting Samba or SMB. Um, we named it Eternal Silence because Samba and SMB are clearly being targeted by Eternal Blue pretty heavily at that point. Uh, and the Spanish there, there's in the new port mapping description, there's some Spanish and I am terrible at Spanish. So my gringo Spanish is Galete Silenciosa, which go ahead and laugh at me, uh, but it roughly translates to silent cookie. So UPMP Eternal Silence is discovered and published. Um, ultimately 3.5 million SSTP responders. So some of that cleanup effort worked. We found almost a million less devices than we did in our previous research. Uh, 227,000 instances of exposed UPMP, 
45,000 had active eternal silence injections. There's no way to really know what they were up to, uh, but based on what they were targeting, the eternal blue link is an educated guess. Um, and that educated guess is based on if I were evil, that's what I would do, right? Uh, I've got this surefire uh, SMB exploit, but everything that's running it on the internet has already been popped. But you know what? If I can find a way around some of these firewalls, I can probably find some devices that are still listening on that that haven't been patched. And now I've got a new place to drop my ransomware. So that's cool. All this research is cool, but we still have problems. <clears throat> the research up to this point it has been via passive identification. This requires scanning the entire internet regularly to find stuff. It's time consuming. We get lots of hate mail and threats for scanning stuff. People don't like when you scan the internet. Guys, relax, relax. You're allowed to scan the internet. It's not a crime, okay? Um, it, it's still time consuming. Uh, it, it results in a ton of logs because we're dumping all of these NAT tables. So it ends up with gigs and gigs and gigs of logs per scan. On top of that, it's very time sensitive, right? We know that the attackers can delete their entries. We know that the entries time out. Um, so the odds that we're finding anything at all is pretty surprising. Uh, especially when you consider that that uh, that reality. So the real problem here is that we can tell where they're doing stuff and where they're pointing stuff, but we don't actually have visibility into what they're doing with it. So if we see them injecting, you know, port twenty five, we assume it's spam, but we have no idea. They could be dropping O days against, you know, SMTP servers. No clue. So we need to fix that. And that's where UP and proxy pot kind of enters the fight, if you will. So what is UP and proxy pot? Uh, the 50,000 foot view, uh, it, it listens for SSDP probes and it directs attackers into a fake UPnP instance. The UPnP in emulation is good enough to get to the injection phase. It's not a full implementation. It could be improved, uh, but it's good enough. Um, from there, we offer on the fly proxy capabilities with man in the middle content inspection and logging, TLS stripping, is also supported. Uh, all of this is easy to modify uh, in the sense that if you want to pretend to be a different device, all you have to do is change some XML files and uh, some text files on disk. It doesn't require code changes to change your device profile per se. So uh, it offers session-based PCAP capabilities so you can come back later and inspect the traffic that went over the sockets uh, and it's written in Golang and Bash. So SSDP emulation, the SSDP response that is currently in the project uh, was lifted directly from the most abused, abused device that we discovered during the UPM proxy research. Um, it's stored in a flat file and disk. You can change it without modifying any code. The one gotcha is if you update the SSDP banner and it changes the port on which the UPMP daemon is listening on, this is what the attackers pivot on. So you will need to change the listening port in code that the UPnP daemon listens on. Um, I didn't have a configuration file set up when I wrote this in my initial thing. It's, it's an improvement that could be made. Uh, UPnP emulation. So the UPnP responses are lifted also from those same most abused devices. <clears throat> All the HTML and XML is stored in flat files. Updating them requires no code changes. UPnP emulation serves basic files, handles NAT interactions. The attacker supplied SOAP is parsed and handled via regex. Uh, it will respond with proper error payloads if criteria are not met or XML is malformed. Responses must contain attacker supplied data so that response use, uh, so that these responses use standard printf formatting. So if you need to change your thing and you know the attacker supplied port needs to be in this chunk of XML, you can just put the percent D and it'll be there. So on the fly proxying, um, this is kind of unique because the attacker gets to control their proxy configuration themselves. So we had to support that. So attackers submit their proxy config via SOAP, just like they're talking to UPnP. Uh, we parse them and then create a session of sorts. Uh, and then we scrape and log plain text across the proxy proxied session in both directions. If they're proxying to TCP 443, uh, it's a special use case, and we assume that connection is a TLS connection, and we do some special man in the middling there. 
So stripping TLS, and this is a hard slide to read. It, it's very upsetting. Um, so attackers actually do some verification when they're using the TLS connections. Uh, the initial deployment saw connections, but they would bail before actually pushing data across that connection. Uh, attackers are fingerprinting certs. Initially, they were doing this via the subject line. Um, there is an automated cloning process uh, where we begin by pulling the domain out of the client, hello. Uh, we then go forward to the injected endpoint uh, and we get the cert with the respective SNI that was provided in the client, hello. We copy the subject field uh, from the remote cert and we mirror it into a self-signed clone cert. And this all happens in real time when they first establish their connection. Uh, this allows us to it was allowing us to bypass their fingerprinting and actually get plain text out of the TLS flows. Literally yesterday, as I'm recording this, literally yesterday, it stopped working. And I don't know why. I don't know if they've changed their fingerprinting. I don't know what is really going on, but I have a year and a half. Well, I have months worth of logs at this point that have this functional. And now that it's about to go open source, it breaks. So I'm sorry. I hope we can figure it out. So the other feature is the automated PCAPing. The project uses GoPacket. Uh, it allows us to create PCAPs on the fly using Berkeley packet filters that are uh, scoped to the individual sessions, uh, the individual proxy sessions. Um, as attackers interact with the proxy injection, the PCAPs are automatically collected. If you find something interesting in the logs, you can find the associated PCAP and see the entire session easily in whatever your, your favorite, you know, PCAP packet muncher is, uh, Wireshark, TCP dump, whatever. Um, if you run out of disk space on your deployed honeypot, this is probably why. That is from a single machine down there at the bottom. You can see that we had 81,100 PCAPs that we ultimately collected for different sessions. And of those PCAPs, it resulted in almost five and a half gigs of disk consumed. So this part hurts as well. Um, the initial deployment was for one year and it, it was four nodes deployed across a single VPS provider. There were geos from Dallas to London to Tokyo, 300 gigs of PCAPs and logs were ultimately collected, hundreds of millions of captured proxy sessions and billions of log lines. And um, you know, I downloaded all that and I destroyed the cluster and then I accidentally lost the backup. So I figured this out uh, literally like a day after I submitted the CFP to DEF CON. Luckily, I had a couple months before everything was accepted and approved. So I was able to deploy a smaller four node cluster um, for the two months between CFP and what you're seeing now. So ultimately four nodes deployed, US, UK, India, and Japan, 39 gigs of PCAPs and logs collected 230,000 captured proxy sessions and 22 million lines of uh, logs. The good news is I did have some notes, so not everything was lost from the previous deployment. <clears throat> and the trends that I saw in the new data are spot on for the trends I saw in the old data. There's not a whole lot's changed, just a lot less data to back up the claims, but I promise you it's pretty much identical. So observations. Um, the first thing is that they don't blindly inject their, uh, their proxies. They actually come and do some testing. So injections, they first come and they insert a test proxy instance, a test proxy instance. Uh, once they confirm that it works, then they inject a real proxy, they utilize it, and then they attempt to delete it. I say attempt, well, we'll cover that. So this is the process of an injection. We see them show up with their mSearch banner. Um, we respond with our uh, SSDP response here. And you see that we point them to 192.168.01 on port 2048 uh, and then Etsy Linux IGD gate desk.xml. Uh, we see them come back within the same second and they then request that. You can see SSDPN and UPMPN there. Uh, they request that. And from there, they 
think that we are the device they're looking for. Once they have confirmed that, then they come back and they attempt to add their port mapping. So in this case, they're adding uh, an entry that will force us to listen to on port 22280. Uh, it's a TCP socket and any traffic received on that is going to be redirected to port 80 on the host at 74.6.231.21. Uh, you can see down there the new port mapping description kind of mirrors the external port that they use. It's sync and then a number. Uh, and then the new lease duration is 600 seconds. So this, uh, this will time out after 600 seconds. Then they come back and they utilize that newly injected proxy. So here you can see they sync 2280. Um, everything up there between the curly braces is the uh, proxy configuration. We can see the source. We can see where ultimately they're going to point to. So 93, 190, 139, 76 uh, on port 53, uh, 57388 is going to send traffic to 7462 on port 80. Uh, ultimately, we intercept a GET request to Yahoo with no headers, so it's super easy to spot. And Yahoo, because they moved to HTTPS, ultimately issues a 301 permanently moved. And this is all they really need for their fingerprint. Once that's done, we see the attacker come back and they attempt to delete the port mapping, but they send us malformed XML. What's interesting here is that the malformed XML apparently has, I don't know if they forgot a null at the end of the envelope, but it continues as a buffer overread. And what we ultimately see here is XML that is not related to this request, but it just happened to neighbor it in memory. Um, what's interesting here, in this case, it's the same injection they just sent us, which isn't, isn't that interesting. What's more interesting, and there are other instances where there is XML information leakage <clears throat> from the buffer overread from other devices that they may have been talking to recently. So in this case, uh, at some point they were talking to a D-Link DSL 2730U. Uh, if you check that out, you can see that it is a popular item on a popular e-commerce website. It's actually a choice item on that e-commerce website and it has 3,100 ratings. So for 1,329 rupees, you can buy this device and uh, that's about $19 US, I believe. And you can inadvertently be a Black Hat proxy too. So these are some of the top talkers, or sorry, some of the top injected test endpoints. You can see there's Akamai, Yahoo, a few others in there. Um, that top one is clearly the standout winner, the 89391512, and they're going to ip.shtml. That's a special page. Uh, it returns your public facing IP address, which here I've clearly modified it. And then this UBCIEG plug that they use for some kind of identification, I'm assuming. So there's also a very large campaign being run against Google. This is predominantly all the TLS traffic. It's very weird. I don't know what it is. Out of the 59,924 intercepted requests going across the TLS sockets, all of them 100% targeted Google. Um, this is click fraud, SEO. I, I don't know what it is. <clears throat> this is a, an example of a caught request. So they're searching for a Cisco Spark board factory reset. We can see their accept language. We can see their cookies, the user agent they used, all that good stuff. Um, we can see even they seem to be coming from Dallas based on the information leakage in the URL, but I can't really confirm that. Uh, also here, we see the response. So we get a 200 okay for their search. We see the cookies. Um, we would, it's not here, but we would actually have the full page content and everything. Um, it's disabled in this case because that was a lot of log lines. I mean, gigs and gigs and gigs of Google pages. So in, in total, they sent 57,237 search terms. There are no really clear patterns. They're from all different geos that they target. They use a ton of different user agents um, and each request gets basically one search per session. So uh, you can see that top result there it has only shown up 55 times out of 57,000 requests. Uh, and it's just a search for the word Samsung in quotes, which is weird. Some of the funnier searches that were captured, 72 hour deodorant, antivirus download now, uh, Marlboro summer camp, leather trousers outfit, 
fa 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 slot hack. I don't even know what that is. I should probably Google some of these to see, uh, but I haven't yet. And like I said, they're they're very geographically distributing their stuff across the Google uh, platform. Uh, there are domains in here that I don't even know what country they affiliated with. So did you know there's a .bj, .as, .jm, .md, .ee, you know? So they, they're clearly tar targeting, you know, um, google.com the most, followed by co.uk, but still, I, there's so many that they're hitting, it's crazy. This is the user agent profiles. So they sent 293 different user agents. Um, and then you can see there's almost normalized clusters of user agent distribution across the, the abuse. And these are some of the top talkers. So it's it's not what you'd expect, right? Um, you would, well, I guess, I mean, I guess kind of it is what you'd expect if it's a single abuser, but the the nature of the queries almost make it seem organic. It doesn't seem like it has an abuse pattern. It almost seems like real end users, but then it's not real end users showing up and popping holes in this stuff. They're all being ferried through a handful of top talkers. And then you have your outliers. Um, if we look at the top 10, we see that um, WorldStream, 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 OVH, WorldStream, OVH, WorldStream, OVH, and Avast. So, let me just put it this way. If you work at WorldStream, find me at the bar. If you work at OVH, find me at the bar. If you work at Avast, find me at the bar and I'll buy your drink if you tell me what the hell's going on there. Because I don't know why Avast would be showing up in this data set, but there they are. So some theories on this. The queries to me seem too oddly human. They're in a bunch of different languages. They're stuff like, you know, the best car insurance in Dallas, Fort Worth area. Uh, okay. Uh, it, so it's too organic to be just purely automated abuse, in my opinion. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure that the people that are using these proxies are aware that they're using them. I have this theory that it may be some kind of residential proxy reseller or some kind of, uh, you know, ultimate anonymous VPN service provider or something. And these, these people think that they're getting like these super secret you know, high privacy stuff. And I'm just sitting here in the middle reading their traffic, which is a problem. So those are my theories. I'd love to hear more theories. Um, you'll also intercept some other stuff um, outside of TLS. Here, for example, are some spam messages that were being routed. These guys were injecting Outlook servers. And then, you know, you can watch the entire interaction. You can watch as they send their, their hello. Uh, you can see as they confirm different addresses are deliverable, and then they build their message and shoot it across. You get to see all of that. The good news here is that Spam Hoss is doing God's work and stopping a lot of that abuse from actually succeeding. Um, this was just a fun finding from the uh, older data set. So while this project was going on, uh, Belarus had a very uh, tumultuous uh, political event where a bunch of people went out and protested the recent election. And as a result, Belarus shut down uh, their internet to news and political websites. And while that's going on, suddenly I started seeing these guys popping up in UPN proxy. So the top site was sb.by, which is a news website. And it looks like they were trying to get to the registration and then solve some captures. Um, the other was photobelta.by, which is a stock imaging host, I think, or something. Uh, but they were actually doing command, or not command injection, SQL injections, which I found pretty funny. And then the third one here is mail.rec.gov.by. Um, according to Google Translate, this is the Central Commission of the Republic of Belarus elections or something along those lines. And they were just trying to check their mail, it looks like. And then on the bottom one here, we've got a news outlet uh, ONT.BY, and then they're trying to get to what appears to be their exchange server. So I just found that kind of interesting. All right, so that's a lot of history, a lot of observations, but now comes the cool part. Uh, I'm open sourcing all of this. Uh, so anybody that wants to take this, stick it on the internet, play with it, modify it, whatever you want to do, 
have at it. It's yours. Um, and this way we can all kind of share the fun and, and see what's going on with these campaigns. And if you find really cool stuff, I'd love to hear about it. So with that open source announcement, announcement, let's get some stuff out of the way. First things first, this project was for fun, it's for research, um, and it was for me to practice my Golang during COVID. Um, second, I apologize for my shitty code. I know it's shitty. I've learned more Golang since then and learned more design patterns in Golang since then, and I really understand how shitty my code is. I'm sorry. Uh, it, like I said, it was a research project. It's not commercial grade software. Um, it served its purpose and it did well enough to serve that purpose. And that's all I really needed out of it. Yes, there are bugs. Thank you for noticing. If you open an issue, there's a great chance I'm not going to address it. Maybe someone else in the community will, but this is not my top priority anymore. Um, so I would encourage you to learn some Golang and maybe submit a pull request instead uh, if you'd like to fix that bug. Um, yes, it's hacky. I know. I am a hacky developer. I'm not your enterprise leading scrum running everything else developer. So it is what it is. Uh, if you have ideas to fix or improve stuff, it's open source. Have at it, boss. Fork away, send pull requests, whatever. I'm... I'll likely accept a pull request. Um, I will likely ignore your issue uh, that you submit to the GitHub repository. So um, some ideas for improvements, if you wanna hit the ground running. Logging could be improved. Content injection could be a thing. Uh, in a world where people are abusing this stuff, I imagine that you could stick JavaScript in pages or you could tamper with cookies or you could inject plugs of text that might be indexable that you could maybe turn up on a search engine later. I don't know. These are just some ideas I've had. Uh, there is a memory leak. I know. Um, the run script actually restarts the binary every restarts the binary every hour to get around this because I haven't had time to actually troubleshoot it. Um, yes, it runs in screen. I regret nothing. Uh, feel free to properly daemonize it if you'd like. Um, this I think would be the biggest benefit if you randomize the SSDP banners and listen on multiple popular exposed UPnP ports, I have a feeling you're going to see a much more diverse set of attackers show up. Uh, my findings may be myopic because I'm pretending to be a single device and that single device is what's being targeted by these people. If you were to diversify the, the target that you paint for your attacker, it's possible you will also diversify your findings. Some additional ideas for improvement. Uh, the cert caching. Uh, when I wrote this, the cert caching was not taking in SNI differences. So uh, it works on Google because all Google servers are just Google. Uh, but if you were to say, have an injection that pointed to some place that was, uh, had multiple domains associated with it, uh, your one cloned cert is only going to be the one that is aligned with that initial request. So you could improve that by in this in the cert cache, actually using the SNI value, the domain name that was used when that cert was cloned. Um, improved TLS handling and proxying. Like I said, it was working. It has stopped working. Improving that would probably fix the problem. Um, improved cert cloning. Clone more fields to better emulate the remote the the endpoint cert that you're trying to clone. Um, Improved error handling because I didn't really handle any errors. So anything is an improvement uh, and improved basically everything else. Um, you can find most of the information you'll need in the readme file. Uh, if there is anything I missed, please feel free to submit a pull request with the updates that you found when deploying this stuff. Uh, it's written in Golang, but it does have Linux de uh, dependencies. So it will run on any, any operating system so long as it's Linux. Uh, you can deploy a node in VPSs very easily. You could also run it on Raspberry Pis or Odroids or anything else. Just stick it on the DMZ and you'll be good to go. Uh, typically, you start to see abuse within the first 24 to 48 hours of deployment. Uh, and it may be even lower than that. So the last thing, if you find something cool, uh, please hit me up on LinkedIn and let me know about it. I'd love to hear if you uh, find new and interesting trends in some of your deployments. And that wraps it up. So go grab the project, pull it down, hack it up, compile it, deploy it. Let me know what you find. Go have fun.